All right. Uh, hello, everybody, and welcome back to Wisdom and Wanderlust. Uh, my name is Michael Bennett, co-founder of ExploreX, joined, as always, by my colleagues Amanda and Robin. Um, and on behalf of our, Amanda, Robin, and our entire team at ExploreX, both here in the States and around the world, uh, thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, we have the great pleasure of uh, talking this evening, uh, this evening here anyway in Seattle, Kate, <laughs> tomorrow yeah. morning there in New Zealand uh, yeah. with our friend Kate Laurie from New Zealand. Um, so we're going to dive deeply into all of the best things about New Zealand and uh, give you guys a chance to ask some great questions and learn more about New Zealand and get inspired to travel there whenever that might be available to all of us, which we'll also get into. Uh, yeah. Before we jump into that conversation, just a few quick notes. Um, if you are new to the ExploreX uh, community and brand, please feel free, to go, feel free to go to our website and learn more about who we are, uh, what we do, what makes us so special. Uh, it's explore-x.com. Um, we recently launched and we'll continue and are continuing to add new benefits and new uh, perks to our uh, traveler community. Um, so if you're interested in learning more about membership and what that's like and how you can join our traveler community, um, you can find a link on the navigation on our website, or you can go to explore, uh, x, explore-x.com slash join, it's a mouthful. Um, of course, always, but even now, uh, particularly now, uh, when things are a little bit slower than usual, we love talking to our friends, our travelers, and our community. So if you have any questions or just want to reach out and say hello, or maybe even thinking about planning a trip for sometime in 2021, we encourage you to reach out to us at hello at explore-x.com. Uh, and you can always follow us on social media at go explore X. Hey, you guys, this is Robin chiming in here with a few housekeeping items before we get started. Um, we are gonna keep this as close to an hour as we can. Um, we are recording this, so those who aren't able to join can see it later, um, and we will email all of you guys a link afterwards. And if you have general questions throughout, please feel free to just enter them in the chat or the Q&A boxes at the bottom. Cool. Thanks, Robin. And that, just a quick note, I'm, I'm, we were talking beforehand about whether we thought there was going to be much attendance for tonight because of what's going on here in the election, but it's great to see that we have a lot of folks that have signed on live. So uh, just a quick welcome to everybody. Um, so again, we're joined tonight by our friend, our colleague, our partner in New Zealand, Kate Lowry. Um, Kate has been, you wouldn't know it by looking at her, but she's been in the industry for over 30 years. She looks younger than that. Um, upon leaving school uh, in the UK, she took a job as a travel agent and really has been committed to the industry as and has passionate about that for, for the time since then. Uh, Kate has lived in Australia. Uh, she lived here in Seattle for 16 years, which is why we were talking about where she was living in Seattle. Uh, and in fact, she met her Kiwi husband here in Seattle um, and raised her, her family here before moving back to New Zealand um, about a decade ago. So Kate, um, welcome and thanks so much for being here. We're excited to, to learn from you and hear more about New Zealand. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's going to be a fun hour. Uh, for <laughs> sure, for sure. So tell us, just starting out, what's going on in New Zealand? How are you doing? How are you coping with elections there and COVID and all things? What's new? Yeah, well, what a year, hey? 2020, my goodness. <laughs> um, we sort of started off the year um, pretty well. You know, things were ticking along really well. And then, of course, COVID hit worldwide and we were very, very quick to um, close our borders here in New Zealand. So I think by the end of March, our borders were fully closed. And the only people now that are allowed to come back into New Zealand are Kiwi passport holders, um, you know, and family. So our borders are still closed um, for the foreseeable future. And, um, but life here in New Zealand, because we were able to do that, we're a small island nation, population of 5 million, um, a fairly compliant bunch of people, you know, pretty community spirited. And um, we had a pretty major lockdown for about six weeks um, when COVID broke out. Um, we had about 1500 cases at most in the country at once. And we shut down for about six weeks. Everybody stayed home. Everything was closed apart from supermarkets, pharmacies, doctors, that sort of thing. Um, you could just leave your house to go for a walk within a couple Ks of your house. Um, and that was it really every day. Um, but within six weeks, we pretty much got down to almost zero cases. 
and slowly from there life has got back to normal so we can now live our lives very freely there's no nothing's closed there's no limits on gatherings we're having sporting events no mask wearing um yeah life is normal apart from we have no visitors and, and is that noticeable uh, do you do you can you sense the or yeah. see or feel the lack of of yeah travelers? i think so. Yeah, I think so. As we've just been through winter, obviously with the opposite seasons for you there. Sure. So as we've just been through winter, maybe not as much, but now it's starting to change. And this is the time of year when normally, you know, the airports are going to be getting really busy. Um, yeah, we'll, we will start to notice it a lot more. Yeah, sure. for sure. And, and, and I, I think you just not to jump ahead too far here, but I think in our, in our last conversation, you mentioned that winter is actually your favorite Time yeah, that well, I really like it. I really like it because I love rugged scenery, wild weather, um, not many people. And I had a family come down here last winter. In fact, it was a doctor and he was coming down for a conference. So we didn't really have that much choice of when he could come. And he brought his family down and um, they did a big trip, road trip through the South Island. And he texted me one day and said, Kate, thank you so much for not putting me off coming in winter. I just literally feel like I have the whole place to myself. So he said it was magic. So yeah, it shouldn't be put off by the fact it's winter. Just bring some extra layers. <laughs> As always, good rule of thumb anywhere you go, right? So yeah. what, what, aside from a lack of travelers, what, what's changed? What have you noticed there in terms of how people are in, interacting with one another? Has anything changed in your day-to-day -day lives? Um, not really. So we, as you just mentioned earlier, that we have had an election here too, um, a big election this year. So Jacinda Ardern, I think she's fairly well known around the world now and um, has done a really good job of controlling the virus here. So we had that big election where she won by a landslide and her party, the Labour Party, um, just to give you some perspective, is similar to the Democratic Party in the United States. So yeah, she won. Um, so that was good. And now we've got the economy to build up. Um, as a in sort of the way that we live and how we interact with people now it's just how it was before to start with people were a little nervous and not understanding quite you know how close you can get and you'd walk down the beach every day and people would sort of walk around you um <laughs> but we don't see any of that anymore got it got it got it yeah. so let, let's step back and talk about you where tell us where you were born where you were raised where you grew up all of that yeah yeah so everyone thinks they asked me where I'm from because my accent's pretty confusing there. Um, but I grew up, I was born in um, Fort well, Bristol in England. Um, so that's in the southwest of England. Um, I lived there through my school years. Um, and then when I left school, I, my mum was like, right, you're leaving school, you're not going to university, you better get a job. And we just booked a trip to Australia the previous year, a family trip um, through a company called Oz Travel in the United Kingdom. It was a fairly big company then. And she said, they're advertising for a ticketing person. You need to go and apply for that. So I did. Um, anyway, got the job with Oz Travel 30, 32 years ago now. I was 18, I think it was. Yeah, 31 years, however long it was. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I started, I was with them for 10 years. Um, luckily, I got to travel a lot through my work because I went through different roles. Um, and then I went and had a year or so in Australia. We used to charter flights down to Australia. I worked at the airport in Sydney, welcoming all the flights and then booking all people's tours and things. That was fun. Then we opened offices up in the States and that's when I came to Seattle and opened up the Seattle office. Ended up working for another company in Seattle for a while, met my husband, had my kids. And <laughs> here I am now <laughs> in, New, in New Zealand, yeah, for 10 years. Where, where are you in New Zealand? I don't think we talked about that. No, so North Island. Okay. Um, about two and a half hours south of Auckland. Most people can sort of figure out where Auckland is. Two and a half hours south and out on the, on the coast. And the town is called Tauranga. And the little suburb is called Mount Monganui. You get it. used to some funny pronunciations. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no doubt, no doubt. So, so let's circle back. That trip to Australia that you took with your family, was that your first time abroad or have you tra been traveling before? No, that? no. So we were sort of um, growing up, we were more campers, sort of growing up in Europe, we would put the caravan on the back of the car and go off every summer, you know, take the month of August and just go to the south of France or anywhere and just sort of camp for a month. So that was sort of our style of, of travel, but we were all really free to do as we wanted. And that sort of just sparked the interest in sort of going to different countries and things like that. Um, and then as I grew a sort of teenager and things like that, and sort of into my you know, late teens, it's really cheap from England to go on package deals, you know, to Spain and Italy and all that sort of thing when you're young. So I did a lot of that with friends. 
and then of course um, enjoyed my work at the travel agency and then was able to just travel all the time through through work and um, yeah that was when I really got the bug and then going from just traveling though to moving to different countries that's another sort of ball game altogether but that sure. yeah I think once you've got the bug and you're not worried and you're fairly independent you can do it what have, what have you learned about the world in your 30 years of working in the travel industry it's small <laughs> <laughs> I feel like it's small like I could go to, you know, 24 hours from now, if I was allowed to go to England, I could be there sat down and next to a fire with my mum and dad, you know? So yeah, it's a small world. I think people, you know, oh my gosh, such a long flight to get to New Zealand, but it's really not. You get on the plane and you wake up and you're here, you know? So that's what I think. It's a small place. Yeah. Have some, have really some, now. have a small little bottle of New Zealand wine on the plane. It makes it, That'll makes help. it a lot faster, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, what, what do you love? What do you love most about what you do? Um, talking to different people all the time and it's I've been doing this for so long and I still love just talking to people about their travels and you know you get the letter from them when they get back and just say oh my goodness that was the best trip ever I still get a buzz from receiving those great letters um, it's just such a personal thing travel and to be able to enable these dreams for people you know and put these bucket list trips together to these far and away places that it's just yeah it's an honor I love it I don't ever get sick of it. Lots of people say, my gosh, 30 years. I'm like, yep, I still love it. <laughs> <laughs> what, would you, what would you change about the industry, if anything? Oh, that's a good question. These are hard hitting questions here. They're just like flying, so. Whoa, I know. What would I change? I don't know. There's many layers to the industry that I don't think people, as a traveler, I don't necessarily think you understand. Sure. Um, so, you know, a traveler will be talking to yourself, who will then be talking to me, and then I'll be talking to the hotels. And so I think I would change many of the online booking systems and make them go away. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. so that they could really get the expertise that people needed when they're planning a trip like this. You know, they're great for a weekend away somewhere if you want to go to New York for a weekend, sure. But on big, long trips, I'd like to see people definitely come to a specialist like yourselves who can get the, yep. the good information firsthand. And we, you know, not surprisingly, we hear that a lot. You know, a lot of the folks that come to us have been like, you know, I, I tried to do this myself. I tried to figure it out. I went on to Expedia or booking.com or fill in the blank, right? You know, Airbnb. Yeah. And I just couldn't quite patch the whole thing together. And it was just yeah. not worth the effort, not worth the energy, not worth the time. And frankly, I need someone to give me some guidance and support. Yeah. So yeah. that's where it's like a big jigsaw awesome. puzzle, isn't it? Um, yeah. You know, you've got, you know, three weeks down here in New Zealand and you're staying maybe in a place one or two, three nights at the most. And so you've got the transfers and the tours and the hotels and the trains and the cars. There's so many pieces to the jigsaw puzzle. So yeah, yeah that's where, that's where yeah. you come in handy. <laughs> no doubt. No doubt. And then again, I mean, not to, to get into this, but, you know, I, I think one of the things that makes us at Explorer X different and unique is that we, we do tend to attract the people that are curious, a little bit more curious, maybe a little bit more open-minded um, about life in the world. And, yeah. you know, oftentimes, you know, we, by my own nature and just sort of the, the, the brand that we're building, you know, with our company, it's, we want to help people use travel as a tool for learning and growth, right? And sort of opening their eyes to that as a possibility, right? It's not just about going to New Zealand. It's about going to New Zealand and maybe taking that as a time to reflect and answer a couple of questions that have been gnawing at you for the past few months, right? Trying to find some sense of clarity around career, work, yeah. love, energy, you know, whatever that might be. And, 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 and then use those adventures to, to inspire a sense of confidence and courage that when you get home, you're willing to do things a little bit differently than, than you were when you left. And, and yeah. that's, I mean, that's, that's why, that's why I do what we do. Or, you know, that's why we do what we do. It's just, it's about that. It's about, helping people in that process of, of growth and learning. Yeah. One of my favorite things to book, I love booking families too, because New Zealand, as you probably know, is full of adventure. And there's all these things you can do um, as a family here that would just create such amazing memories. You know, the bungee jumping, you know, a tandem bungee jump with your daughter or your son or something would just be so incredible. You know, one of those things that you'd never forget. And jet boating and all those sorts of things that you can do here that are just sort of off the wall a little bit but just create such amazing memories yeah and push you outside your comfort zone a little bit too which is a good thing 
hundred percent. You have to stretch yourself, right? You have to stretch yourself. So, so let's, 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 um, let's pause for a second and step back and let's, let's sort of just set the foundation, set the stage. Uh, I'm sure everyone that's joined us tonight, they know about New Zealand. They generally know where it is and what to expect, but can you just sort of start fresh and start from scratch and just give us an introduction to New Zealand? Yeah. So New Zealand, you're going to be at home in the US. I assume everybody there is listening in from the US and you're going to fly down to the West Coast, probably West Coast, hop on a plane, usually in the evening out of Los Angeles, San Francisco. You can have a nice glass of New Zealand wine. You can have a nice meal and a movie. You're going to wake up next morning down here in New Zealand. So most of the flights um, all come into Auckland on the North Island and then um, from there you filter out. Um, New Zealand, you probably know, is made up of two different islands. We've got the North Island and the South Island. They're very different. And a lot of people um, always get the advice, well, everyone told me just to go to the South. That's where it's the most beautiful. Well, it is very beautiful, but the North Island you should stay and see too, because they're just, as I say, quite different and both equally beautiful in different ways. So the North Island is rolling countryside. There's not many flat areas anywhere. Um, and sheep everywhere, sheep farms, dairy farms, um, beautiful coastline. On the west coast, you've got the rugged um, cliffs and the black sand beaches. If you've seen the movie The Piano, it's quite an old movie, um, that was all filmed on the west coast of the, of the North Island, big black sand volcanic beaches, so that's stunning. Um, and then down the east coast of the North Island is sort of surf beaches and big white, wide open white beaches with surf rolling in, and that's a really beautiful area too. And then you've got the mountains down the middle of the North Island, the Tongariro, which you probably hear, heard of. Lots of scenes from Lord of, Ring, Lord of the Rings movies were filmed there. Um, great um, vineyards, wineries, bike tracks, all that sort of thing on the North Island as well. And also, if you want to learn a bit about Maori culture, that's probably the best place to do it as well. Rotorua, Bay of Islands, that sort of thing. Mm. Um, and then Golfing to get to the too. South Island, sorry. Golfing too. North Island? Golfing, definitely. Ever, both islands, yeah. Okay. Yeah, amazing golfing here. And you don't have to play the big courses here. You can go to just a little munif municipal um, golf course here and be right on the water for Hutakawa trees with the red flowers um, and pay $10 and have a great game of golf. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and then South Island, you know, all those quintessential things you think of with New Zealand. Great big mountains dropping into the ocean, beautiful rivers and fjords. Um, much fewer people, so pretty unpopulated. Um, you'll definitely see more sheep than people on the South Island. Um, and then, you know, some of the famous areas like Queenstown, which are the capital of adventure here in New Zealand. So that's where you'll do your bungee jumping, jet boating, beautiful vineyards around on the South Island too. So sort of, if you like red, that's around the Queenstown area or the Pinot Noir. If you like white, that's at the top of the uh, South Island in the Marlborough region for Sauvignon Blancs. Um, so yeah, both of them equally as, as great, I think. Um, this is sort of a random question, but I've always wanted to know this, like, why are New Zealanders called kiwis? Well, the kiwi fruit. It's from the fruit. Or the kiwi bird. Well, this is why I'm confused. Well, you know what, now you've said that, <laughs> I might be a little bit confused about that too. <laughs> <laughs> It's probably the kiwi bird. I mean, that's our national bird, the flightless kiwi. So it's probably our bird. Okay. Maybe the kiwi fruit was named after the bird. You know, I'll have to find that and let you know. Again, hard hitting questions <laughs> here. Hard hitting questions on wisdom and wanderlust. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, I mean, they, they both sound, Amanda, you've spent some, some time in New Zealand, not to put you on the spot, but do you want to maybe take a minute to share some of your experiences? Sure. I was uh, working for a company, travel company in Auckland um, and spent most of my time on the North Island. Um, but like my background here is Waiheke Island, um, which is a wine island off the coast of Auckland. Um, beautiful beaches. I love the North Island. Um, I did get down to the South Island as well, which is, is beautiful. Um, but most of my time I, I spent on the, on the North Island. So... I, I didn't get to travel as much as I would have liked to. My, my trip got, got a little shorter than, than I anticipated, but um, it, was, it was fantastic. I had a wonderful time. Any, any I'm definitely going to go back. Come any, back. Any favorite memories that you can share? Oh, goodness. 
Um, all the different beaches were fantastic. I'm not really a beach person. I'm more of a, a hiker mountain person. Um, but all the different beaches were the sands all different and the mm. surfs all different. And, um, it was, it was stunning. I, I really enjoyed the variety of, of places and everything is, is close comparatively. <laughs> like you can, you can get from Auckland to a beach for a day trip and, and then you can go down to Rotorua and go to, or Hobbiton and see where the film set and, you know, everything's for us close for New Zealanders. It, it all seems a bit farther, but sure. we would without question do day trips to a lot of places that they would maybe take a long weekend to. <laughs> got it. Got it. Um, I'm thinking about this randomly and I apologize, but it, what, there's a pretty large music festival that happens. Is it in January every year, Kate? Yeah, Rhythm and Vines. Yes, yes, yes. And where uh, is that? Uh, yeah, so that's in Gisborne, which is on the uh, east coast of the North Island. And that's right. where the, we're, I think we're one of the first places in the world to see the New Year in. So that's why it's it's there. And it's called Rhythm and Vines. And it's huge. I mean, it's sort of like, I don't think it's as big as Glastonbury by any means, but it's that type of festival. Yeah, it's mm. big. Um, and they Will also have the Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> Will that be happening this year due to yeah. COVID? Uh, yeah. Yeah, we're lucky in that respect. Yeah. So, um, yeah, my daughter goes to Rhythm and Vines every year. Mm. Um, 20 now. So she will go. Yeah, they have a great time. Um, they have sort of, you know, all the young kids just take their tents, but they also have glamping sites there for us older folk if we want to go, <laughs> go do that. And there's another one called Rhythm and Alps, too, which is down in Wanaka on the South Island, and that's mm. just after the New Year. So same performing artists go down and, and do that one afterwards. So, yeah, it's a big deal. Oh, that sounds awesome. We had, I had a, uh, a traveler a couple of years ago that went down to New Zealand from Arizona and um, spent a few days there, and we got we were able to secure some VIP passes and meeting some of the, the artists. Oh, and wow. stuff like that. That's cool. Yeah, it was, it was super fun. It was super fun. Yeah. So... Um, Seasons are different. Seasons yes. are opposite of the Northern Hemisphere. So maybe talk yes. about that a little bit. Yes. So um, we are November already, my goodness. So we're November, so we're spring going into summer. Um, and you can, I don't know if you can see outside of my window, but today is not a good example of a, a spring day. It's pouring with rain and it's really, really windy. Um, but two days ago, it was sort of 75 degrees. So what's that? I think that's about... 22 degrees celsius something like that yep. um and bright sunshine so we're in that time of year it's just a bit mixed um so october november um you might get a bit of mixed weather december tends to be a little unsettled sometimes too we get through christmas it seems and then january first comes and summer sets in and we have long summers here so sort of january february march well into april um it can stay really really nice and the, and the the days are not as long as they are in Seattle. So I remember in Seattle, it was often dark till 10, 10.30 at night in summer. Um, whereas here, it's dark by nine most nights. Um, so that's, that's kind of a difference in summer. Um, and then April, May, June. Yeah, fall is nice. It's a nice time of, sorry. Yeah, fall, that's right. I'm trying to get the right way around. It's a nice time <laughs> of year too, and it's nice. It's not as busy. Um, you can get better rates at hotels. Kids are back in school, so there's not so many people on the road. Um, and then winter, yeah, as long as you're geared up for winter, it can be really great because it's quiet and you'll get the, the, like, like the doctor said earlier, you get the place to yourself. Yeah. And w weather on the South Island in winter can be pretty yeah. rugged. Yeah, so pretty rugged. So we have, um, obviously ski, ski fields here in New Zealand. There's one on the, on the North Island called, um, Whakapapa, which is at Mount Ruapehu and, uh, it's, coming from the states where we were really spoiled with skiing it's kind of like going to Snoqualmie just out of Seattle if you know what that's like <laughs> yeah of course yeah but on the south island Queenstown Wanaka um, just outside of Christchurch they have some really fantastic ski fields so they sort of open July August September and then by October really it's time to to close those down but yeah great big wide open mountain skiing no no trees in sight 
Is there a time of year that you like best? Yeah, or is it yeah, I do. I like um, April, May a lot. Um, I just think it's cooled off a little bit because it can get really, really hot here in summer. Um, it's also really busy traditionally in summer. Um, and I think once the kids go back to school, sort of end of February, March, April, it's just quieter. And as I say, the rates drop a little bit, which is beneficial for travelers. And um, it's just not, yeah, it's just easy. It's just a nice time of year to explore and hike and get outside and yeah. And I mean, I also like the shoulder, it's called shoulder seasons, sort of October, November, or sort of March, April, May. And I also like October, November. You do have to have every piece of clothing you can imagine just to cover yourself for any weather. But, um, you know, it's still good for getting out and about and just enjoying yourself and it's not so busy. So it does get busy here in summertime. For sure, for sure. And you, you mentioned this before and I wanted to bring it back up and maybe now's the good time to do it. You mentioned families. Um, yes. Talk about New Zealand as a family travel destination. It's perfect because um, you've got no language barriers. You know, you might, there's a few funny words that we say, but you soon pick those up. <laughs> and they can be the butt of many family jokes, trying to pronounce the road signs in the car on the way around. Um, the food's not that different from places in the world. So you'll always find something to eat that you can, they have great food actually. It's quite influenced um, by Asia. So you get some really good food that way. Um, the traditional food here is really good. It's just, it's a little bit of everything for everybody. So the food's good. All the kids will like it as well. Fish and chips on the beach, you know, you can't go wrong. Um, and there's some, and there's there's a, New Zealand's famous for its honey as well, or at least a specific honey. Yeah, 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 yeah. Anuka honey. So it's just got really good medicinal properties, I guess. Mm -hmm. And the higher, it's quite expensive. Like a kilo of manuka honey can go anything up to about a hundred bucks. Um, just depending on how much manuka and what the grade and quality of it is in the honey. But yeah, a lot of people drink it in their tea or, and they even put it straight, like if you've got a wound, they'll put manuka honey straight on the wound um, or a cut and it will heal it. And there's opportunities for people to go and sort of check out. Yeah, so yeah. Yeah. yeah, definitely. And you can purchase it at places. And you can also, there's a place here just not too far from where I live in Tauranga that you can go to a bee factory. And I don't know if you call it a bee factory, but you can go and see how all the honey is made. Can you yeah. put on like the outfit and the beekeeper yeah. outfit? You can? Yeah. <laughs> you can. That's amazing. That's yeah, beekeeper for a day. I love it. I love it. There's a, there's a woman, I used to work for a company, a, a travel company based in Houston. And, um, we shared an office space with a woman who was a Kiwi and she would import uh, New Zealand products, including the Manuka honey. And so she had yeah. this whole storage area of like all kinds of really amazing products. And yeah. you know, we get to sample them. It was quite fun. Can you remember what else she had? Was there any sort of um, Tim Tam biscuits or like what? Cookies, I should say, not biscuits. Yeah. I mean, there was all kinds of things. I was mostly drawn to the honey, you know, yeah. for the most part. And then she good. You have a, a couple good bottles of wine, like like real good bottles of wine here and there, and to be a nice little happy yeah. hour at the end of the day, you know, once a week yeah. or something like that. So, but yeah. other other crafts and other products too. So, yeah. I'll have to send a link. Um, I see. I, it's been a couple of years. I'm not even sure she's still in business, but if she is, I'll find a link and yeah. we'll send it out in the email afterwards. And if anybody's interested, they can yeah. talk to her. Sarah is her name. You, hey, you mentioned. You mentioned Tim Tams. Have you ever done a Tim Tam slam? No, I haven't. What is that? <laughs> this is something that my fiance taught me when he got back from New Zealand. So maybe it's yeah. a thing over there. Maybe Amanda knows about this, but um, you bite off both ends of a Tim Tam and you have to suck a hot chocolate through it before oh. and eat the, and eat the cookie before it melts without oh. your hands. <laughs> yeah, that, that is the kind of crazy thing that <laughs> New Zealander might do, but no, I haven't. <laughs> That Maybe like, I will now. I'll try it. Sounds like very wholesome fun. I'm thinking it was some kind of like cocktail that you were gonna like drink. Yeah. No, it's very wholesome. <laughs> <laughs> More like a sugar high situation. Yeah. <laughs> um, um, but getting back to families. Yeah. Um, yeah. But as I mentioned earlier, there's just loads of activities that you can do together as a family that everybody will enjoy. Um, you know, like the jet boating and the rafting and the mountain biking and the hiking and. And just and there's a really great choice of accommodations here too. sort of boutique properties that have sort of two bedrooms or a, um, like a two bedroom suite or something like that. So they can all be together. Yet mum and dad have got their own space and the kids have got their own space. And um, and it's just such an easy place to self drive too. you know, you can just rent one of the bigger cars and, and off you go. Yeah, it's good. It's really good. 
perfect family destination. Um, all right, so lots of questions, lots of great information there. Um, tell us about the situation now as it pertains to travel restrictions. What's going on now? Can people visit or when do you expect folks in the States to be able to potentially visit? Yeah, so this is the, I wish I had a crystal ball, Michael. <laughs> Yeah. Don't we all? Um, so I think that, well, definitely for the rest of this year, our borders will remain closed. Um, and I think the talk is that they will start to allow countries into New Zealand, depending on how COVID is in that country. So, um, for example, Australia, um, they're talking about opening a bubble between Australia and New Zealand. In fact, Australians, we can go to Australia now um, and not but we have to quarantine coming back. So people aren't, if that makes sense, because you're not gonna go and then come back and quarantine sure. for 14 days. Um, and then there was a Cook Islands bubble they're possibly talking about, but Jacinda's not really entertaining any travel into New Zealand until international travel to places like the States and Europe. I honestly, at this stage, would be surprised if it's before the end of quarter four, 2021, maybe into 2022. Uh -huh. Got it, got it, got it. Wow. Yep. Yeah. But saying that, I think that New Zealand will be one of those places that when travel does resume, it's going to be really, really popular because it's just wide open spaces. Um, you know, it's good for the soul. <laughs> you know, it's just, it's a safe place for people to come. There's big spaces, so there's lots of social distancing going on. Um, so I just think it will be um, one of those places that is really popular. So if you are thinking about coming, even if it is 2022, let's just get through 2021 and then 11 months out, start thinking about planning because I do feel like it's going to be busy. So flights open up 11 months in advance and then, you know, start planning on you know working on itineraries now so when the green light comes you're ready to go yeah absolutely and yeah. one of the things one of the things you mentioned that i think of course is critical for the covid slash post covid situation are these smaller properties right where families yeah. couples can have you know exclusive space right so they're not necessarily around others i know we've talked in the past but can you give us a, a sampling of some of the, some of these types of properties and which ones are some of your favorites yeah, so um, for example, on the South Island of New Zealand, um, down the West Coast, um, you'll come to the Gla Glacier region. Um, Franz Joseph Glacier um, has a beautiful little um, resort called the Rainforest Retreat. And there's um, like these tree huts built up in the rainforest. I would try and like to suggest places that reflect the local character of the place you're staying. So if you're staying in a rainforest, why not stay in a hut in the rainforest? <laughs> Um, and they have these two bedroom deluxe tree huts that are beautiful and completely sort of self-contained. Um, two bedrooms, um, a hot tub on the deck, all that sort of thing. And, and so that would just be an example of somewhere you can be and be away from others. Um, another one in the Abel Tasman National Park, which is at the north part of the South Island. Um, the Abel Tasman National Park is really famous for hiking and um, sailing and kayaking. Um, you'll see dolphins and seals and all that sort of thing. And just inland is a beautiful forest area and there's a hotel called the Resurgence. And again, it's these beautiful log cabins just sort of all through the bush. Um, so you've got that space between other people. Um, you can dine in your room if you want to, or they have like dining room up at the main part of the lodge too. So um, I do think New Zealand's making a real effort. Um, we have a system over here called Callmark. And I met with the, um, the guy in charge of Callmark the other day and they're working now really hard on making sure that all these places are really prepared for people when they come back because they realize that it's like the cleanliness and the able to social distance and the spacing of everything has just got to be in line with, you know, the worldwide standards so people feel safe. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And then when it comes to getting from place to place, you mentioned the self-drive, which is a, a classic you know, New Zealand experience, yeah. right? Yeah. Say, say more about that and, and what that's like for people. And, and Yeah, yeah. So really we don't have, we'd have a couple major freeways here in New Zealand, um, in and out of Auckland on the North Island, in and out of Wellington, the major city, our capital city on the North Island, and in and out of Christchurch on the South Island. And apart from that, it's all one lane one way and one lane the other. Um, and every city is quite, or town I should say, is quite regional. So you'll sort of drive from 
I don't know, Auckland to Rotorua and you'll just go out of the city and then you'll be in the countryside for miles and miles and miles. You'll see nothing but a few houses dotted around going, my gosh, where do they get their groceries from? And then all of a sudden you'll turn up in Rotorua and there's another little town. So it's very sort of spread out like that. Um, it's easy to navigate. We can, of course, organise GPS, but you really don't need it. You've got your phone or that signposts everywhere. Um, you just need a US licence. You don't need a New Zealand licence or an international licence of any sort. Always book a, um, we drive on the other side of the road, so always book an automatic, so you're not trying to change gear with the door handle. <laughs> um, yeah, and it's just easy, like it's simple, and it's nice because you don't have to have such a structured itinerary when you're self-driving. So you can book your accommodation, especially during peak season, but then you know you don't have to book a day tour every day, you can just figure out where you want to go on the way. There's lots of places to eat and drink and there's little cafes on the side of the road in the most obscure places that you'll wonder well, what's going to be to eat in there and you'll go in and there's beautiful baked goods, lovely sandwiches, hot chips, all that sort of thing. There's all, you know, great food and um, no, it's just a good way to travel, a really good way to travel to self-drive. Um, but if you don't want to and you're not comfortable doing that, we can get you around quite easily. There's some good train systems. Um, we can organise drivers for you, um, like a private driver for a day. Um, fly between each place. The regional airports are everywhere. You know, I can fly up to Auckland from here in 25 minutes. So there is a way to get around if you're not comfortable driving. Yeah. But I, yeah. if you are, it's the best way to go. <clears throat> yeah, I, you know, it, it's something that I've only started in the last five years or so uh, in terms of the self-drive. And, you know, what a, what a game changer. You know, it's... Yeah. Yeah, internationally, of course, here in the States, there's road trips and all those things. But usually when I travel, it's flights and trains and that kind of stuff. But, yeah. you know, Portugal, uh, um, um, Iceland and a few others over the past, you know, the past couple of years have just it, like it opens up so much to you. And yeah. really the spontaneity of travel, right? Like, yeah. and I've done in the past where I've had a driver or we've been on a train and I'm like, wow, I wish we could stop there and do this thing. And yet, yeah. and some of my favorite memories travel memories in my life have happened from stopping in this little tiny village that, you know, mm -hmm. I just wanted a coffee and popped in and met this awesome husband and wife. And they sat down and made a, you know, lunch for, I mean, yeah. all of those, you know, the, the spontaneity of it all yeah. is really what is so special. And that's not only available to you, but even more available to you when you're able to self-drive. Yeah. And um, you mentioned there that, you know, you'll go into a cafe and meet husband and wife. Well, you could do that here too. And they'll probably invite you around for a barbecue at their house that night here. Cause like people are so friendly. It's almost like, Oh my goodness, that's strange, but it's not. They sincerely would love to have you over for a yarn, you know? So, and another thing that people do here too, and not necessarily for the whole trip is to have a camper van mm. or an RV. And, um, that, you know, doing the North Island with a car and hotels and then combining it with an RV maybe on the South Island, it's quite a good combination too. And that way you're really free to go wherever you want at your own pace if you're a more flexible traveler, yeah. Sure, sure, sure. You now, for our purposes, right, we like to plan things. That's what, why we yeah. do what we do. And so the, there's a part of this that we want to leave open and free and, you know, yeah. let, let the organic nature of travel just sort of take its course. And then yeah. there's also things that we like to plan and they need to be planned in advance. So yeah. what are some of the experiences that you love to design for travelers that really get them into, into the culture and behind the scenes more yeah. than just a typical tourist? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, you mentioned Amanda, you, um, did you live out on Waiheke Island or you just visited Waiheke Island? I just visited. I, oh, I lived yeah. in the CBD. Yeah, yeah. The Central Business District. Yes. <laughs> Sorry. <Got that. laughs> Americans don't know what CBD is. Um, Central Business District. Yeah, yeah. perfect. Um, so just things like, you know, a lot of people say, oh, come into Auckland and then get out again. It's just a big city, you know. But actually getting over to Waiheke for a day or even a night is pretty amazing. Um, amazing arts and crafts over there, great vineyards, um, you can lavender farms, um, olive oil, all those if you're a foodie um, and you love wine then definitely go over there but there's also some really interesting Maori sort of cultural history there as well too and we work with um, a lady over there that does private tours and can just take you around the island and you'll still do the wine and the food but she'll also tell you some Maori stories about it as well which just adds another layer to the you know you're learning a little bit more just about more than sorry just about how the wine tastes it's there's just a bit of culture there too which is really nice 
Um, and things like private guides and things like that do need to be booked in, in advance because they are, you know, highly sought after some of the really good ones. Um, other things that I love to sort, I like to make sure that when people go to an area, they try and stay in a hotel that reflects the area that they're in. They do the tours that really show off the area that they're in. So Hawke's Bay, for example, Napier, which is on the east coast of the North Island, um, have them, that's a really famous area for food and wine. So have them stay at Craggy Range in a villa, in a vineyard, overlooking the Tookie Tookie River with Tomato Peak sort of towering over them. Do you know what I mean? Do that. Yep. Um, get picked up from the airport in an Art Deco vehicle um, from the 1950s or 30s, because that's how the whole town was rebuilt after an earthquake in Art Deco style. And they really love the whole Art Deco thing. They have festivals there year round and it's, so just sort of designing things like that, because there's a lot more to New Zealand than just amazing scenery and, and, and fun people. There's lots of pieces of history all throughout that really, you can really learn about. Um, Wellington, stay in the QT Hotel. Wellington's a really eclectic city. Um, you know, there's probably every other restaurant might be a vegan restaurant. They have music festivals there every weekend. They have op shops everywhere. It's a really sort of, yeah, eclectic, fun city. So the QT Hotel is a museum art hotel. So just amazing, bold artwork all over the walls. And so that's what I try and do as long as people are comfortable with it. It's just really try and show off each area throughout the itinerary rather than staying in just generic hotels that they could be staying in, you know, anywhere at home. Sure. Sure. Um, yeah. And again, it's, it's, it, I think the best experiences that, that we plan and that our travelers always rave about are those that balance this guided and, you know, and, and sort of uh, in-depth where they get to meet a local guide or have a particularly planned experience and stay at a particular yeah. property that we've, you know, carefully selected for them. And then yeah. self-drive, go out there and explore on your own, like have a few days free to go wander and hear some recommendations. And, Absolutely. and, and we always challenge them to step into their curiosity and their creativity and yeah. do things that, as you said, push your comfort zones, because that's where the beauty and, and the, yeah. the learning of all this takes yeah. place. But like you say, there, there are places, for example, if you want to fly down to Milford Sound from Queenstown, which you know, is a really popular thing to do, Doubtful Sound out of Queenstown. Those are the sorts of things that need to be pre-booked because they just are such, especially in summertime, because they just get so busy. The Transalpine Express train from Christchurch across to Greymouth on the South Island, beautiful journey, um, but again, gets really busy in summer. So that's where we work with people, you know, we all work together and make sure that we get those key things in place and then leave some free time for them to just go off and explore on their own too. Sure. What, what is your, I mean, we, well, a comment and then a question. What we've heard from our, our traveler community over the past few months is that as this work from home um, lifestyle becomes more, more prevalent and potentially permanent, yeah. You know, that they're willing to, as they look forward to traveling at some point in 2021, some are actually even traveling now, you know, yeah. Mexico and, and other places like that, Croatia. Yeah. Um, but they're looking to take longer trips, right? That, that yeah. week, one week is now two weeks, that two week is now three weeks. Yeah. Um, one, are you hearing and seeing, I guess, I guess since people aren't traveling down there now, but I, I guess, are you hearing the same things, number one? And two, if yeah. you were to, to design a, an extended, let's say, I say extended, but maybe for Europeans, it's not that extended, but like a three week trip. Like yeah. what are some of the things, like what's the route? What would you do? Yeah. So I would, I'd try and obviously see both islands. Um, but I'd, even though you've got more time, I would do it at a slower pace. Um, if that makes sense. And I'd base myself on a few key areas, um, maybe even for five, six days each and just have a car and just explore and try and live like a local for a while. Um, so I would probably choose somewhere like the Bay of Islands on the North Island. So that's, you fly into Auckland and then it's a three hour drive north of Auckland. Um, beautiful, beautiful beaches, lots of little islands dotted around that you can sort of kayak to, take out jet skis, sail, um, there's boat tours as well, that sort of thing. Um, it's rich in history up there too. It's where the, it's the Waitangi Treaty, which is where the Maori and the Europeans signed the Treaty of New Zealand to agree about living together peacefully <laughs> um, many, many years ago. So there's a lot of history, a lot of culture there. 
and it's just really really relaxing it's really really relaxing and so i'd probably just get to new zealand i'd head up there for a few days and i would just chill <laughs> yep. um and then come on down through the north island and just sort of spend a couple of days maybe just maybe just doing a bit of sightseeing through rotorua and lake taupo and then I'd um, head over to Napier and Hawke's Bay and then I'd probably get myself a little place on a vineyard for a few days. <laughs> and I would, still with my car, I'd um, just enjoy going to local farmers markets. I'd do an art deco tour of the town. I'd head out to Cape Kidnappers and have a game of golf. I would go and see the Gannett Colony. Um, there's just so much to do in that area. If you like fly fishing, you can do that on the river. Um, so I'd spend some time there. And then I'd probably drive on down to Wellington, just have a look at the capital city for a while, do to Papa Museum. And then I'd cross over to the South Island and I'd probably base myself in the Abel Tasman National Park for four or five days. From there, you can tramp, beautiful hiking. Um, I would kayak, um, seals and dolphins and penguins and you name it, you'll see it. Um, great wineries, great food markets. Um, really eclectic place nelson have you heard of pix peanut butter i don't know that i have oh i don't know if it got famous over there it's very very famous here pix peanut butter and that all started in in nelson they have this quirky little factory there showing you how it's all made and all the story behind it everything in new zealand's a bit quirky <laughs> <laughs> you'll learn that it's quaint people think it's cute but it's you know um so i do that and then i probably just head down to queenstown for the rest of my time and from there, there's beautiful world-class wineries. Um, you can get down to Milford Sound. Um, you can go jet boating, you can go rafting, or you can just literally have a beautiful little home on the edge of the lake um, with a good book and just chill there too. So those would be my areas. It sounds lovely and wonderful and I cannot wait to do it. When are you coming? <laughs> well, I can't. I mean, geez, talk to, talk to Jacinda. I mean, geez, come on. I know. I'll see what I can do <laughs> if only I had the power no that that sounds amazing and I, we've had a few questions uh, from some from folks here in the chat about sending oh, some of the examples of some of the properties and some of the experiences that, that yeah. you were talking about so we'll be able to follow up with people afterwards That'd as be well great. I got two more questions for you before we 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 wrap here um one you mentioned at the beginning that you know one of the most important parts of this work for you is hearing and the stories from your travelers that have yeah, really, how, how yeah. that's impacted them. Is there an experience that you'd be willing to share with us from that one of the travelers had that has really impacted you? Oh gosh, we're digging deep here, aren't we? I know. Hard hitting, like I said. I think, do you know what? I've had quite a few couples come down here and end up proposing down here, which is always really sweet. Um, I just think over 30 years I've had so many travellers and they all, you know, have had such an amazing time here. Like I, you never get complaints from people coming to New Zealand. It's so, we're so lucky in that respect. Um, Were there any unplanned proposals? Like someone that was so blown away and inspired by it that they were just... Yeah, there was. There was when yeah. I first, yeah, when I first got here um, and I was working for a different company at the time. And yes, there was down in Queenstown um, and they just last minute arranged for a proposal. They were staying at Azor Lodge, which is on the hill overlooking the Lake Wakatipu in Queenstown, it's beautiful. And they did actually, yeah, all of a sudden decide that they were gonna do it anyway, but they just, were, they just had to do it then. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So the hotel called me and told me that. When people are traveling, I don't know about you, but I always, you know, you hear it, get a text from a traveler or an email from a traveler while they're traveling, you're like, you know, just for a quick second, you're like, oh, I hope everything's okay. And then you get texts like from the doctor saying, oh my God, this place is amazing. I feel like I've got it all to myself. Thank you so much. It's just little things like that all the time that you get that you're just, yeah, just really thankful for. Mm, absolutely. Absolutely. All right. I have one more question and then I'm going to turn it back over to Robin for some rapid fire. And we've had some questions come in from the audience as well. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I'll ask this in two different ways and you can respond either way. Okay. Um, Part one or question version one is what what wisdom or advice uh, would you want to share with our our listeners and our traveler community? Yeah. Um, the other way to think about that is if you could 
have a conversation with your 18 year old self after these 30 some odd years of experience in life, what would you tell yourself? What would you recommend? Well, um, so always take longer, always take longer than you think you need. Um, because however much time you book off work or you'll always wish you'd stayed longer. But in saying that, don't try and pack in too much. Like you don't need to see every town in New Zealand to have an amazing time. time. And if you've only got 10 days and two weeks, don't move every single day to a new place because you just waste so much time traveling. Even though the scenery is beautiful, you're not there really immersing yourself in it and really enjoying it. So don't get carried away in trying to see too much. Take a bit of extra time in each place. Um, if you think you want to stay one night, stay two. If you think you want to stay two nights, stay three. Because you might just meet somebody that changes your life. You might just discover something that you um, didn't know about yourself. Or you might find your new favorite ice cream or your new favorite wine or something. You don't know. So just always, always, always just take a little bit of extra time in each place. Definitely. I'd say to my son all the time, he's like, oh, I said, try this out what I've made for dinner. He's like, oh, no, I'm not eating that. I said, imagine if you'd never tried ice cream, you wouldn't know you liked it. <laughs> you got to try. <laughs> Fair enough. Now I'm going to cheat and I'm going to ask you that second question anyway. So you can go back. You've got 30 seconds oh, to yes, speak to your 18 year old self. Yes. What wisdom and advice are you giving your 18 year old self? I don't know if this applies to us all now, but I wish I'd taken an actual year out and just traveled the world with a backpack. I never did that. I've always traveled through work and with family. And I mean, I've been really blessed. I've done a lot of amazing things in my life. But what I wish I'd done is put a backpack on on my own when I was in my 20s and just gone and taken a year and, and gone to some wild and wonderful places. But hey, it's not too late. I could still do that now, I guess. Yeah, and we're, we're developing these adult study abroad programs where even if you can't spend a year, you can at least spend a month someplace. Yeah, yeah. So. <laughs> so that's what I would do. Awesome, thank you, Kate, I appreciate that. Yeah. Robin, you have some rapid fire for us? Yeah, there is one more question from the audience that I wanted to ask real quick first. Um, so let's see, they, they're wondering if there's any changes in tourism regulations after the volcanic eruption on White Island last December. Gosh, that was, yeah, that was terrible. So um, where I live, you can see, I can see White Island from my bedroom window. Um, and I remember that happening and it was, um, gosh, it was awful. Um, you cannot go on White Island anymore. Um, there are boat trips that go out to the island and go around the island and then come back in, but you cannot set foot on there. Um, and I think that's probably, that's obviously, I think, definitely a good thing. Um, and I can't foresee that changing in the, in the near future. And I think they are looking at the alert levels a little more closely too. Um, they have certain alert levels as to what the volcano is doing and whether it's safe to go on, on the island. And I think it was at alert level two and it goes all the way up to four. So they thought they were safe going out there, but you know, mother nature is very unpredictable. So, um, so yeah, nobody's allowed on there at the moment. That's probably not changing for a while. And, and I think they're definitely looking at those alert levels to make sure if they ever do allow people back on the island, it's safe to do so. Yeah, absolutely. Awesome. Okay, well now I will get into some rapid fire. Um, so this is just a few questions to um, get the first thing that comes to mind for you. Um, so first off, we, we touched on um, food in New Zealand a little bit. Do you have a favorite New Zealand meal? A favorite? Yes, fish and chips. <laughs> okay. <laughs> fresh, fish, fresh fish off the boat, straight. Yeah, fish and chips. It's a really, really, oh, really yeah. popular thing here. <laughs> nice. That sounds great. I'm getting hungry. Um, <laughs> are you currently reading any books right now? And if so, what are you reading? Do you know what I'm reading? Do you really want to know what I'm reading? So I'm reading Chelsea Winter's new cookbook, um, which is a completely vegan cookbook. I'm reading that. Um, I did go vegan for a while and then I didn't. And so now I'm trying to like get back there again. And I'm also reading, you've probably heard of it, um, Jay Shetty's Think Like a Monk. Yes. Yep, that's what I'm reading. I love it. <laughs> awesome. Um, what's one essential item you always bring with you when you're traveling? A credit card. <laughs> that is essential. <laughs> I, um, with my limit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
Um, and last but not least, if you were to summarize um, New Zealand in one word or a short phrase, what would that be? Idyllic. <laughs> it's just easy. It's an easy, beautiful country. Like, it's easy to get around. This is not one word, but it's just, there's nothing really to not like about it. it there really isn't. It's safe, it's fun, it's adventurous, it's beautiful. Yeah. I'm lucky. You are. And if we're all lucky, we'll get a chance to come down there sooner rather than later. So, yeah. uh, Kate, we got we to gotta wrap here, but thank you so very much for sharing your wisdom and really stoking that sense of wanderlust that we all share. So thank you. That's okay. It's a pleasure. Thank you for having me. Yeah, you're very, very welcome. Um, a, a quick note, we did have a couple questions here about how people can can reach you. So um, the best the best way to do that, honestly, is to reach out to us at hello at explore-x.com and then we can we can facilitate that conversation with Kate so Roy we got your question and we're happy to do that um, also some people were interested in learning getting maybe a sketch of that that three-week itinerary that you sort of walked us through because it was just yeah. intriguing. so um, if there's a way to just kind of bullet some of those ideas out then we can share that with people and of course with yeah. the understanding that all of this is going to be customized if someone were to travel yeah. to you know, we'd plan something very very specific to them interest yeah. budget etc but Absolutely. I think, I think what you were sharing struck a chord. So um, if you can share that with us at some point in the next few days and we can get that out to our, our, our listeners. Yeah. Um, again, questions for Kate, hello at explore-x.com or Kate at explore-x.com. Um, next week, we have our friend Brian from Toto Santos down in Baja, California, Sur, And that'll be at 9 a.m. Pacific next Wednesday. Um, Again, uh, please feel free to uh, follow us on social media at Go Explore X. Uh, check out our membership program at um, explorex.com slash join. Um, and we look forward to seeing you next week. Thanks, Robin. Thanks, Amanda. And thanks, Kate. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.